Hi there and welcome to this week's video. Today I'm joined by high school teacher and the author of Being Prime Minister, JDM Stewart. He's actually working on a, a new single volume history of Canada's Prime Ministers. So he seemed to be a, an ideal candidate to talk about the shocking state of Canada's historical literacy. James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. So the hook for this discussion is obviously the uh, debacle that took place in the House of Commons where 338 MPs gave a standing ovation to a Nazi, apparently unaware that anyone fighting Stalin in the 1940s was probably allied with the Germans. I mean, it seemed to me that a lack of historical knowledge is widespread, not just in Canada, but I think across the Western world, and that subsequently there's a lack of appreciation for our democracy and the sacrifices that were made to, that have been made for it. Do you think that's fair comment? It's totally a fair comment, and for some of us with a longer lens on this issue, this is not a new story to, to us or to me. So we've been talking about the woeful condition of Canadians' understanding of our history for literally decades, and this is just the latest iteration of it. It's not a surprise, but it speaks to this larger issue that you know, people like me have been fighting for their whole their whole lives, really. I've been a teacher for close to 30 years, and one of the reasons I got involved in the, in the discipline was to teach young people about Canada's past. And we're still working on that. It's, it's a, long, a long battle. And the issue that happened in the House of Commons uh, just recently is just the, only the latest example, John, of the occasions when we're reminded of our woeful understanding of the past of this country. So we're going to get into the education curriculum in a little bit, but, uh, but obviously this is all intensely political. The government of the day, the federal government, does not seem to value history, and one of the manifestations of this was the uh, removal of images of the Vimy Memorial, the Fathers of Confederation, from the new passport. I think it's fair to say that many in this Liberal government see uh, history as it was celebrated, at least by the Harper government, as elitist, patriarchal, and even racist. When uh, J. L. Grandestein wrote a book called Who Killed Canadian History, he l lamented the overemphasis on what he called grievance history. Do you think he's got a point there? Do you think that that's become what we're, uh, has started to eclipse the more tradi traditional views of history? You know, it's interesting that you bring up Jack Granistein's book, which is celebrating the 25th anniversary of its publication this year, and so I recently reread it because of that anniversary. And and uh, you know, the changes haven't happened since then. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And here we are again talking about grievance history 25 years later. It's it's still happening. And this is not to say that there aren't things that we have to address as a country that are legitimate grievances and things for us to understand. But the problem is that um, we're, still, we're still doing it and, and we've started to, you know, you mentioned the Trudeau government. And the Trudeau government really isn't a fan of Canadian history. Uh, the passport is a great example. And I understand people who, who say, John, that, oh, it's the passport, you only use it uh, once in a while. But if you think about, you know, all these little things count when you're trying to uh, keep a country together and, and tell your own stories. And think about your own home. And in your own home, you probably have little trinkets, pictures, little bits of memorabilia that are about your family history and identity. Well, that's what, it, that's what the passport was. It was a small little piece of Canadian history and identity. And now it's been taken away by, by the Trudeau government. The other thing is, you know, the Harper government was, uh, it had its own philosophy of history, which is quite a bit different from the, the Trudeau philosophy. But they, they wanted to at least celebrate parts of Canadian history and encourage kids to get involved in it. For example, the Ministry of uh, Canadian Heritage sponsored a Canadian history essay contest for students all across the country. They would come up with five different questions for kids to choose from, and this was a, a great uh, a great opportunity for kids to get motivated and learn about their history. And you know, we just recently celebrated the centennial of the discovery of insulin by Fred Banting and McLeod and Collip. Uh, 
So because of the direction that the government has been taken, the Royal Canadian Mint minted a coin for the commemoration, and there was no, there was no mention of banting on the coin. Canada Post did a postage stamp of insulin. Instead of Banting's face on the stamp, there was a vial of insulin. And so they're trying to, um, I guess, push off to the side any Canadian figure who might fall into that old category of old white men. And, uh, you know, we can't, we can't recreate the past. Um, if Banting was white, he was white. There's nothing we can do about it. So. I'm saddened to see the the lack of um, the lack of emphasis on Canadian history from from the government, and even in the prime minister's speeches, he you know when was the last time you heard the prime minister celebrate how great of a country Canada was or invoke its history in a positive way? We know that he's apologized for Canadian history more than any other Canadian prime minister. But it'd be kind of nice if the government would celebrate the country and its past a little bit more. Because for all of our sins, this is still one of the greatest countries in the world. Absolutely. So this brings us to the related point. Uh, when history is in the news, it's, it's usually now because something's being expunged mm. or pulled down. And I know that you wrote about uh, First Among Equals, which was a website about Canadian Prime Ministers that was deleted by Libraries and Archives Canada, yeah. because in their words, it no longer reflects the current understanding of history. I mean, that sounds Orwellian. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it is positively Orwellian. You would think that the, the leading historical repository for the country would have an easy mechanism to get into evaluating and looking at the history of our prime ministers. And I don't think anybody is asking for uh, a whitewashed version of history. That would be uh, a complete disservice to the country to just try to whitewash history. But they took this down primarily because of the controversies around Sir John A. Macdonald. And on their website, which was definitely in need of refreshment, they hadn't mentioned Macdonald's role in residential schools. So they just got rid of it to make it easy. But I think that's a big mistake. To me, why, why wouldn't they decide to uh, understand that, okay, the website needs refreshing, let's get a new one ready, and then we'll get rid of the old one, and then we'll relaunch this new one with a refreshed interpretation, because history does change over time, there's no question about that. But why just make things disappear? It's because people are afraid of controversial issues in Canadian history, so it's better just to get rid of them rather than actually address those issues head on and have a mature adult discussion about the, uh, the great things that have happened in Canadian history and the things that we regret happened. Right. There does seem to be a new history and it seems to be more represented by something that's being promoted this month by the Ontario Principals Council. It's 2SLGBTQQIAT month recounting the history of diverse lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer communities. Now, I'm not dumping on it. I think any history being taught is a good thing, but that sounds more like sociology to me than the history that we're, we're, we're used to. Yeah, I mean, it may, um, it could go into all kinds of different disciplines, John, and sociology would be one of them, but history encompasses all kinds of things from our past. And so as we become a more diverse and inclusive society, which I think is, is important, um, we understand that we need to see other representations and voices in history. And so, you know, I, when I started my teaching career, I wasn't teaching about LGBTQ uh, history in my classes. It wasn't really on the radar, but that's going back 25 to 30 years. But then as we become more inclusive as a society, I changed my teaching practice and content to bring in some of those stories. For example, the purge of the civil service during the 1950s and 60s and 70s when if you were um, deemed to be a potential um, same-sex or a homosexual person, then you were deemed a, a risk, um, a security risk, because you might be subject to being um, blackmailed by a foreign, a foreign uh, enemy. So that's an important history to, to tell kids. Uh, 
and the same with other BIPOC groups. This is an important part of Canadian history. So I, I don't have a, a, a beef with that. But I think what, what happens is we, we all run over to one side and say, okay, this is what we have to teach now. This is the most important thing. And it's almost like a, a, a moral um, issue that you're trying to, to solve rather than being true to the craft of history. I was just so, going to ask you, does, is the emphasis on social history squeezing out political and economic history? You know, that's always been one of the big battles in history, particularly at the post-secondary level, where social history has really eclipsed political history. Um, I have a former student of mine, and God bless her, she's doing a PhD on Louis Saint Laurent and his role in Canada during the Cold War. And, uh, you know, I hear stories from her about the kinds of debates that are happening in the university level. And I'm sure it goes on in many of the history or social science departments in high schools across the country. This has been an age-long debate that also Jack Granitstein points out in his, in his book. And Jack says, I'm not opposed to social history. And by the way, neither am I. What I do is I teach my kids about both political history and social history, economic. I try to give them a really well-rounded view of what constitutes history. And, you know, some kids gravitate to military history. Some kids gravitate to social history, others to political. So it really, it depends on, on the student. But if you think about, and I'm just talking about teaching history right now, if you think about trying to capture a kid's interest, then you might as well bring them to a buffet table and decide, let them decide where they want to go back to uh, for more. And uh, I think that's the best way to handle it. Well, let's, let's go there. Um, talk about the, the curriculum in, let's start in high schools. Yeah. Uh, or even middle schools if you want to go there. But, um, I mean, it seemed to me that it used to be, history used to be core to that curriculum. It doesn't seem to be anymore. So what are we teaching? So let, let's take a big national view of it first. There are only four provinces that require a mandatory course in pure Canadian history, and that's uh, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Manitoba. BC has a mandatory course that is kind of history, but a little bit more involving world affairs. So we don't value Canadian history across the country by requiring students to take at least one course in high school. That is unbelievable that that would be the case. So. You know, people have been fighting that battle for decades and drawing attention to it for a long time as well. In my experience, where I teach uh, high school in Ontario, you know, we have history in grade seven and eight, which looks more at the earlier, you know, the colonial colonial days of uh, the Seven Years' War and things like this. Even Confederation gets taught in in grade eight. But then you're asked to do basically a hundred years of history in in a single course, and you know, based on some of the things we've been discussing already, you can see that there is a huge content requirement to try to, you know, you're supposed to include everything. We're trying to be... So this is 20th century, yeah? 20th century history, yes. So, you know, we're trying to be everything to everyone, and it's kind of impossible to do. So you have to make your choices as a history teacher. And, you know, often that will be in response to what's happening in current events. Uh, it could be what's happening in um, anniversaries, if there's other things, you know, to draw greater attention to one thing or another. Um, and so it's, it's a big challenge. But to me, the bigger issue is when I said to you earlier that there's only four provinces that demand high school students to take a course in Canadian history. No wonder people don't understand that the Soviets were allies in the Second World War as opposed to enemies. It makes, it makes perfect sense. We're not teaching our kids. So, so there is a rudimentary uh, awareness in those four provinces, at least, of the Great War, the Second World War, the Cold War, even, um, I guess, the Charter of Rights, perhaps. Yes. But, but nothing at all pre-1914. No. You see, it used to be, like, you know, the curriculum was revised, um, I guess it was about six years ago, maybe seven. And uh, the course used to begin in 1900. So now if you're in high school, you're not gonna learn about Wilfrid Laurier, for example. Um, and so 
you know, you talked about the wars and we talked earlier about social history versus political history. And, you know, that that debate is one that means uh, you might see th there's certainly a movement to diminish the amount of time you spend on teaching the First and Second World Wars, because for some wars are seen as, well, that's just dealing with a small segment of society. And why would you know, it's um, it's violent, too. So why would we deal with that? So there's there is there is always a, a debate going on about what's going to get taught. And it just it varies from from school to school and teacher to teacher. So you have the set curriculum, whether it's Ontario or, or Manitoba, whatever the case may be. But then you have to make some decisions when you're the teacher about where you're going to place the emphasis. And certainly another sect that is on the way out is prime ministers. You know, prime ministers aren't getting taught very much anymore. Um, I've tried to hold on to that as, as, as much as I, I could. Um, but that's becoming uh, another target where, you know, prime ministers aren't being taught either. So, so let's have a little bit of fun with this. We, sure. I'm, I'm creating a, a federal ministry of education. Yeah. Naming you the minister. Right. Giving you of course, a that blank. requires a constitutional amendment, John, because <laughs> education is a provincial jurisdiction. But yeah, anyway, of course, of we're course. having we're, fun. But we're now living in a benign dictatorship where I'm uh, ruling the roost here. Um, yeah. If you were given a blank slate and, and said, you know, how are you going to inspire and educate the next generation about history, what would, what would you do? Well, first of all, I'd call together all kinds of stakeholders from across this great dominion and have a conversation first and see and see what comes up. Of course, it's Canada. We would yeah. panel panel discussions are. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Are, uh, so birthright. You know, one of the interesting things. This might surprise you a little bit, but um, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has come forward with its recommendations about what we need to teach in schools about um, residential schools, etc. We changed the course that, that I was teaching a couple of years ago, and, and instead of starting with the First World War, as the curriculum kind of suggests, we decided, like, let's just start with treaties. So if I was making a new course across the country, I would start with treaty history, because that's where a lot of our issues um, come from, is, is treaties, but it also would enable us to just look at Canada before uh, or at the time of colonization. So let's start with treaties because that you see the threads of a lot of our, our problems in the country from the issue of treaties. Then I would get into, I mean, I guess I'm going to say history needs to be taught uh, over two courses in high school because there's no way I can teach um, Canadian history from, uh, I, I would definitely want to start with our indigenous peoples, but then if we're getting into the political history, we have to go back to um, 1759, one of the most important dates in Canadian history, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. So many of our issues stem from that. That also brings in relations between uh, not just French and English, but also obviously there was significant um, indigenous contributions during that war as well. So 1759, and then we're going to get on to the, the greatest hits of, uh, of Canadian history. We're going to get into responsible government. We're going to get into confederation. We're going to get into our um, 20th century. And we mentioned the wars, the Great Depression, the struggle for rights throughout Canadian history. The role of immigration would have to be a thread that we pull throughout the course because this country was built on immigration. And that's an important piece of telling our story. But there's also, you know, I would bring in opportunities for students to engage and and look at some of the the great personalities of history, because if you're trying to get kids interested, you need to tell stories. And those stories can be about either um, great events. They can be told about interesting people. And it doesn't have to be. Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier or, or Lester B. Pearson. What about Viola Desmond, who was fighting for equality in Nova Scotia in the 1940s? What about Konojuak Ashavak, the great Inuit artist? There's all kinds of stories. What about Tom Longboat, who was an indigenous soldier in the First World War? 
What about the 1972 Summit Series when Paul Henderson scored the winning goal in what is probably the only flashbulb moment in Canadian history? And, and by that, I mean a moment where people can tell you where they were when it happened. So I would tell the stories. I would um, build it around moments that created great change. I would try to get kids to think about myth versus reality. And that's the kind of story that, that I would tell. I, I, uh, I always, I think from my own personal experience, historical novels, historical fiction novels yeah. were, were, my, were my way in and yeah. always provided a colourful way to bring history alive to the point where I even wrote one. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to ask you now is, uh, and I'm going to, have to take the prerogative to go first, but what would your recommended reading and listening list be for a, let's say, a 14, 15 year old to try to inspire them? And I know what worked for me, which was the Flashman novels. Right. George MacDonald Fraser's uh, 12 historical fiction novels. Uh, I would probably be deplatformed for suggesting it now because they're, they're uh, of their time, let's say. Yeah. Uh, it's about a fictional um, 19th century soldier, Harry Flashman, a bounder in a cad who finds himself involved in the charge of the Light Brigade, the Sepoy Mutiny in India, the Battle of Little Bighorn, all historically correct in their detail, but it just puts this one uh, character into them, like, uh, like Zelig, perhaps. Um, I think that kids would still enjoy those novels. Almost related, I just finished reading Winston Churchill's Early Life, which reads like a, a it is uh, autobiography, and it reads like a Flashman novel. He was involved in the Battle of Omdurman in 1898 in Sudan. And uh, an amazing story about how he escaped from captivity during the Boer War, uh, an incident that made his name. The final thing I'd recommend is a, a podcast called The Rest is History to, uh, to English historians, um, easily available on Apple and Spotify. And it really runs the gamut. They've got 300 episodes and they go from from Plato to NATO and back again. So what would you, what would you pick? So you've given quite a comprehensive uh, list, John. And so let me start by telling you that I've always tried to use fiction and poetry and art in my teaching. So I would get my students to read a 1929, 28 novel called Generals Die in Bed by Charles Yale Harrison. He was an American born man who fought in the First World War for the Canadian Expeditionary Force. It's like a Canadian version of All Quiet on the Western Front. Right. It's very readable. It takes students right into the trenches in a novel form. And so my students have always loved it. Um, I think that Pierre Burton books are highly captivating and they cover the gamut of, of stories. So I would recommend to you know, a 14 or 15 year old who, who likes history, even if they don't, um, pick up a Pierre Burton book or even Peter C. Newman, who is probably the greatest writer that this country had. The other thing I would mention about books is books sometimes scare students because they can be big and, and scary with all the pages. And so I've always told my students, you don't have to read the whole book. Like, read the first chapter, see if it grabs you. Read the middle chapter about the topic that seems really interesting to you. You don't have to read the whole book. Dip in your toe and get a flavor of it. Think about books about the Titanic. There are lots of uh, young person books about Titanic, and I know it's not strictly speaking uh, a Canadian story, but there were Canadians on, on the ship. And, you know, that's such a fascinating tale that that might be something that gets kids excited about about history. Des Morton wrote a great book called A Short History of Canada, so I would, I would recommend that. And in terms of viewing, I've been a big fan of the CBC documentary series, Canada People's History. And it's amazing that I don't even think it's available on CBC Gem. So if you talk about hiding some history, for whatever reason, the CBC is keeping that great television series kind of hard to find and yet it's 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 quite good it stands the test of time uh 22 years later so those are a few of my suggestions and i also you know art is really great there's so much great art about this country 
uh, including the art from the First and Second World Wars. There's a lot that can be learned and, and taken from that. Photography as well. So we've got uh, a ton of a ton of resources, and I probably should mention the Heritage Minutes too, since we're talking about various sources. Historic Canada has done a great job of revitalizing the Heritage Minutes. Yeah, and I agree with they that. Have yeah. Some, yeah, they have something for everybody, and it's very easy to access. It's one minute. Sometimes you just need to, you know, in Life of Pi, that the the novel, um, was it Jan Martel? I think wrote it. There's a, a little anecdote in that novel where he says his teacher um, lit a match and that flame sparked him into gaining an interest in history. And sometimes all we have to do for a kid is light a match. You know, yeah. we don't have to set a fire. We just need to light a match for kids and then they, they, they uh, take it away on their own. Yep. Well, hopefully this uh, video has lit a match for, for anybody watching. Uh, we've, we've gone on way too long, but that's, I think, because we were having a good discussion. So, right. James, thank you very much for coming on, and best of luck with your new book. Thank you, John. My pleasure.